Welcome to America's Heroes Group. And welcome back to America's Heroes Group. Our roundtable discussion, we are globally connected with Military Family Matters and with our partner, family caregiver, Keisha L. Jackson. May is Mental Health Awareness and Military Caregiver Month. Our host is Cliff Kelly. I'm Sean Claiborne, the co-host. Our executive producer is Glenda Smith, and our digital media producer is Ivan Ortega of Scouts Honor Productions. And Keisha, can you hear us? Keisha, are you there? Looks like we lost it for a second. He should be back on the line with us shortly, I'm sure. She's a U.S. Air veteran and family caregiver. We're going to be talking about the raising awareness and the appreciation for military caregivers during Military Caregiver Month, which is something a lot of people don't realize. Can you realize. hear me? I can hear you now. Great. Right. I can hear you from the beginning. We're going to turn the dial tone after a second, but glad you're back on with us. Yeah, yeah. Good to be here today. So as I was saying, there is, we have Military Caregiver Month, which most people don't realize is a thing. Um, but it is something that's important is, is we have an aging population, especially in our veter veteran community. What can you tell us about what that this month means to you? Well, military, uh, the month of the military caregiver, you know, personally, is very, very important to me. I became an advocate for caregivers, military and caregivers, after caring for my mom, who had inoperable lung cancer, and caring for my brother. But, the, um, you know, for caregivers, caregivers don't, think about being heroes right we don't we don't think about it we don't we don't see it in that that terminology but military caregivers start coming about it was probably about the terminology military caregivers and our hidden um, heroes around 2011 when um, former um, uh, senator elizabeth dole when her husband was in walter reed and he was in there for like 11 months and she was walking around or talking to the different caregivers there who's um, spouses had been injured and they were there and she found out she just started hearing their stories and start learning about wow um, you know they're doing a lot and they're under a lot of stress they're under a lot of, of pressure and so that's kind of when it became popular to hear the words caregiver or military caregiver because you know we are people we just do what we're supposed to do for our family members and a lot of that is including including care you know? I think that's really, really uh, poignant, really, really respectable, the fact that you are taking that responsibility because I've talked to a lot of people, and, I've, and it's surprising, but people don't realize that there are a lot of families that don't have that person that, that, that's strong enough to de take on that responsibility. It's a big responsibility. Um, it often requires a lot of sacrifice. What can you tell us about that sacrifice and also, also personally what that meant to you? Well, it is a great sacrifice, but when you're doing it and when you're caring for someone, you don't see it, especially your loved one, like me caring for my mom. I didn't see it so much as a sacrifice. I also uh, I saw it as an honor because my mother took care of me. You know, and spouses, a lot of times, they don't see it as a sacrifice. It's just what you do. But then, or even children, you know, when you think about there's 5.5 million caregivers, but in that populace, there's also children that are helping mom or dad um, whether it's with their medications, you know, maybe getting their prosthetic. I mean, there's just so many different things that children are doing as, as well to help to make that family a whole unit as much as they can because their normal is no longer a normal, you know? Mm -hmm. So what are the resources that are out there available to veterans? So just give give people some background. I looked at the National Council on Aging, their website, and it has some information on there that mentions that, like I mentioned before, veterans are getting older, but most of the veteran population, people don't realize, are seniors. More than half of the veteran population are seniors. And veterans yeah. are more likely to need care than the civilian population. And reliance on well, VA benefits is key. So what resources can we get access to as veterans? Well, let me, um, before I mention to some of the resources, let me mention, you know, there's kind of like they say, there's like the pre-9-11 and the post-9-11 caregivers. And so those pre-9-11 caregivers are those from, you know, World War One, the Korean conflict, um, Desert Storm, Desert Shield, where they kind of lump them up in that one. But in particular, like uh, Vietnam and um, in yeah. World War II, okay. they, you see them more as the aging caregiver. So it's a person that's potentially caring for their parent, right, or an older uh, person caring for their spouse because of those aging things and helping them and making sure that their um, Social Security or their disability or all, all of those things are lined up. Well, the post-9-11, those are going to be your younger ones. You know, those are 
that have deployed after, of course, after 9-11, those that have been, even some of those that have come back from Afghanistan, even most recently, those are the ones that are categorized with more of the uh, TBI, traumatic brain injuries, more of the post-stress disorders, those different things like that. You, and so you kind of have them categorized in two different areas. So the resources for one may not necessarily be the resources that are most helpful for the other. So for the um, um, pre-9-11, you know, one of the resources that I always tell people about is your local area agency on aging. And I know I didn't say VA, and I'll I'll get to that, but um, they are targeted in your local area to help those that are aging about probably was last year we had someone I had someone on on the show um, and she was talking about her mother who had dementia well when her mother first was diagnosed with early dementia she didn't think about it because she was financially in a place that she was able to take care of her mother so she didn't sign up for the local resources that were available or the local um, through the local area agency on aging and so she waited about I think she waited about three years later and she went from being um, not signing up to like number twenty three thousand something on the list. You said from not signing and up to twenty three thousand in three years. Wow! And even after that, she was on the wait list, and it took her another eight years before she got to the top of the list. Wow. And so, when you're thinking about those pre, you know, those older ones, you definitely want to look for those type of resources that are out there that are available. You know, there's resources that are available on your. At the, you know, almost like we could say, like at the federal level, then you got them at the state level, or I should say the national level. You got them at the state level, and then you have them at the local level. So those are kind of things you want to look for. Those that are in the older areas, you know, of course you want to look into like Medicaid and Medicare, and definitely the uh, the VA. You know, the VA has several different programs for those that are aged, it's like the age blind and disabled. But there's sometimes there's a lot of um, research that you have to do. And then you may be in a community where you don't have a VA, right, or you don't have um, 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 military doctors that can uh, assist you in those particular areas. Now, the post-9-11, those are the ones, again, they're, they're going to the VA. They're looking for those different type of things more. Some of them are, you know, with the um, – uh, traumatic brain and some of the others, they're looking for a different type of specialists, you know, to help us with those type of uh, challenges that we're having. So those are the things that the person is doing or the, um, the, uh, the military person is doing, but then you have to think about what is happening for the caregiver, right? So it's, it's a lot. It can be a lot. Mm-hmm. So now I, also, um, oh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. No, go ahead. I was saying because there's so there's different things you can get through this through at the national and the state level and the local level, and the, particularly with your local Department of Aging in your community. But then there's veteran service organizations. It seems like they've been taking on the big burden of stepping forward to fill in the gaps where the VA can't help. Yeah, yeah. So collectively, I mean, these are just I mean, a Fisher House. These are like some for that are still like active duty or those that are. The Fisher House is, is a great organization. You know, the Fisher House is considered like the home away from home for military for military families. It allows them to stay there free of charge while their loved one is being um, seen at a, a military or a VA hospital. Wow. I mean, you have, of course, the VA. The VA has programs for caregivers to help. It has a a, 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 um, a hotline. They have a respite program. Respite program. Then there's. Um, funding, there's educational programs that you can tap into the VA. Um, AARP is a, definitely a great resource. I Just last week I gave a, a presentation about some of the um, AARP caregiver resources, and the organization that I gave the presentation to, they said they had no idea that AARP was doing that much for in the veteran space in the community. I mean, there, there there's a lot. There's... Um, there's the Rosalind Carter Institute, um, I mean, Operation Family Caregiver. There's just so many. But what you have to do is you have to do a lot of research because a lot of times when you, as a caregiver, there's a lot of resources that are out there, but you have an immediate need right now, right? And so you may not have time to do a lot of research or you may not even know where to start. Mm-hmm. So what do you do? So where do you, where do you start? Well, the key is, if there's an opportunity, you know, one of the reasons why I like 
I love having the show and to be able to bring the topics and the different people on to the show is because one of the things that you want to do is just like in the military, right? You go to basic training, you go to boot camp first, even before you ever do so many other things. And so trying to help people to get in that mindset of saying, you know, I may not be in a situation now, but tomorrow, so what can I do now? You start learning about different resources. You learn about different programs, you know, like I was saying, a local area agency on aging, or you learn about the VA, or, and you just, you just talk about those different things, mm-hmm. right? So I think it's a good point. Thinking about the need before it becomes a need, thinking about what you might need to do in the future, basically making, preparing yourself, being prepared yeah. and, and ready, you know, for that situation. I mean, we don't train the day, you don't start training the day you get invaded, you start training years and years and months and months ahead of time so when that invasion yeah. comes you're ready to go you know, you know that's what they yeah. do for ukraine so there is a lot of times when you become a caregiver it's not something that you gradually get the opportunity to move into it could be whether a military accident something that happened you know i've had someone on the sh- on the show jessica she was on the show and she was talking about her husband you know he stepped on an explosive device mm. right and so she said and when we were talking to her, she was already already prepared for her husband to come home whole, and she said she hate to say it, or come home in a box. But she was never prepared for her husband to come home with all of the challenges that he had to go through. You know, so now your mindset has to shift from a twenty something year old or a thirty something year old where you're planning to start a family, and now here you are, like for Jessica, you know, going back and forth through where she was living to Walter Reed for months at a time and then getting off the plane, going, picking up your children. So there's all of these different, um, um, different situations that you're, you're thrust into and you just have to be ready to be resilient and, re- and flexible to be able to manage through every situation. Right. And I, and to add to that, I think it's really important too, as veterans, we need to also think about our own care and, and thinking about what's going to happen to us and what kind of burden will we place on our families if the time comes where we start to deteriorate, whether it's because yeah. of injury or, or something we brought back from the war or, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. I mean, that's something this really, really all Americans, all Americans should have some type of health care plan, a long-term care plan to make sure that they're, if they're in a situation where they have to go into a nursing home or have someone come into the house to take care of them, or at least have at least somebody that's going to drive a point to make sure that, you're being taken care of 24-7 if you can't take care yeah. of yourself. Yeah. You know, I, I was listening to a, a webinar a while ago, and it was um, a, a spouse of a, a military um, veteran. And she was talking about, you know, she, she, when her husband came home after being deployed, there were no external factors to know that anything was wrong. But she said after time, she started noticing a decline in different things and the children even started noticing. And she mentioned specifically one time when she had, they had gone to Costco to get pizza for dinner, I believe, or something like that. And she mentioned that there was a lady in there. They were standing in line waiting for their pizza and there was a lady in there. And I guess she wanted to kind of rush through the line to hurry up and get her pizza. And so she said, all of a sudden her husband just reacted and she said it was not good and she said she knew the situation was not going to be any better and she said she realized that she couldn't calm him and her children were kind of on the side you know like hysterical you know frightened and so I guess he was arguing with the lady and so I guess the husband came with his sharpened card and his son and so that you know they started kind of arguing back and forth and so she said she tried to deflect it by telling this man um please my husband is a veteran that didn't work. He said, I could care less about your husband being a veteran. And then she said, well, he has PTSD. And when he said that, that able, able to kind of help him to back off. But then her husband told her, um, he, he, they were in, having a conversation one day and he told her, he said, not only had he been uh, suicidal, he was homicidal to the point where because of everything that he had been dealing with in his mind, where he wanted to not only take his own life, but he even wanted to take his boss's life. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's so important as the caregiver to make sure that you're getting the resources that you need, but it's also, like you said, making sure that person, that military person, is being taken care of, getting the resources that they need, getting the help, speaking up, letting people know that you're not okay. You know, because a lot of times we don't want to do that because in the military we're okay or we almost like have to be okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And that's a, that's a really training of the brain to really get to the point where you realize that the reality of it is 
and even in the military, we don't win any wars on our own. Everybody has to fight in a unit. That's why they call us units. The yeah. Units, and all the units work together. So it's like when you come back from from you know being from service, you have to understand that you have to be in a position where you can self diagnose not self diagnose is the wrong word, but to basically recognize that you need some help. Recognize you definitely, that you're doing something wrong that did require some expert intervention. Definitely. I mean, that's the that's the best way to do is to realize, like you said, we can't go through this alone. But think about it. You know, Sean, just we're talking about caregivers from an adult perspective. But remember, there are also children caregivers. Right. So there's the children in that home that's experiencing that. There's the children that are really helping, trying to help the mom or trying to help their dad or they're trying to go to school and get educated or they may not be able to go to basketball practice or football practice. So it really is the nucleus of the family has to deal with this um, challenge that the family has. You know, um, and those, again, I was saying earlier, when the post 9-11, those may be like a 20-year-old family or 30-year-old family. And you're, in your mind, I'm not thinking that you're thinking at 20 years or 30 years old, you're looking for the next 20, 30 years of your life. It's going to be in this space of, 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 of this challenge, mm -hmm. you know? Right, you're not thinking about yeah. the challenge until it actually hits you. And like, like yeah. when I joined the military, one of the things I said I would not do just because I didn't know if one day I might have to go to war or go to overseas or be deployed. And I had already, you know, experienced from previous generations, you know, this, uh, the idea of, you know, a parent or someone being deployed and not necessarily coming back or not or coming back different, whether they're injured or, or uh, permanently disabled. So I said, I'm never going to get married in this in, in this situation. If I get the, if I'm in the military and I'm starting out and I'm young, I'm 19, I'm 18, 19 years old, I'm not getting married until I come back. Yeah. That was my, that was yeah. my idea. Uh, but we have to think, but of course that's not, I mean, that was my situation. Not everybody can really do that. It's not, that's not normal for everybody. I ended up going to the military, meeting somebody in the military. I almost got married in the military. However, yeah. the thing of it is, like I said, we have to get to that point where we realize that, you know, life continues and what the what if scenarios in life we, get, we have to be prepared for, just like we prepare for battle and prepare for everything else. You're going to have to prepare for these types of uh, what-if scenarios that we hope we never get into. Yeah, I mean, whether it's preparing for um, your trust, your will, putting these different places, powers of attorney, you know, talking about these different things, mm -hmm. um, uh, what are your preferences it's, uh, in death, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of your funeral, your religious beliefs, a lot of these things that we just don't talk about, and it's all about being prepared, but it's also helping that, that caregiver, because if you're on medication, of course, they need to know what type of medication you're taking. But sometimes as an individual, you don't want to share those things, but you have to, mm -hmm. you know, in order for you to get the help that you need or even in order for the caregiver to get the help that they need. Because caregivers, um, there's a good percentage of caregivers that are, that are very depressed. Yeah. Because now they have all of these other things that are going on, so they don't get a, t a chance, an opportunity to really tend to themselves and to their own needs. I think there's a wise man who said that the depression was contagious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, 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 really, it really is. I want to mention something, too, because I, we're almost out of time. Um, next week, I mean, I'm sorry, next month, I definitely want to, to, to mention this. I want to, I'm going to have someone come on to talk about scams. And it indirectly but directly ties to what we're talking about today because there's a lot of scams that are going out there to uh, target in military, to veterans, to military caregivers, whether it's because you're trying to get um, your VA claims done or they're telling you you, can, you need to pay for medical records, you know, for, for copies of your medical records and different things like that. So I want to be able to talk about that next month in June because it definitely ties into some of the stuff that we're talking um, about now and just helping in that preparedness and everything that we need to do as the individual, whether it's from the military side or from the caregiver side. Keisha L. Jackson, yeah. U.S. Air Force veteran and family caregiver, appreciate your time. Oh, well, thank you, Sean. Thanks. It's always great to hear your voice. Yours too. This is America's Heroes Group. We'll be right back.